Hi, I'm going to predict that the sun is going to set on the Colette's conjecture sooner rather than later, but maybe not soon enough. And the essence of the reason for this is 3x plus 1 sequences must come to an end, just like the conjecture. And sequences cannot grow in steps. For a sequence to grow, it has to add steps. So you have to imagine some sequence that has an infinite number of steps. And the problem is the 3x plus 1 function is a is not an inverse function. There is an inverse function, and that's the exact inverse of the 3x plus 1 function. That definitely adds steps. I mean, it continues to grow, and there is an infinite number of steps. And one knows this is the case because it's a it's an inverse function. For the 3x plus 1 function to behave in that way, to diverge from any given number, remember it's every given any given number except one would and I know mathematicians don't like to hear this word impossible it would be impossible because there is no inverse operation the when you see numbers increasing in sequences that's not steps that's just numbers increasing in sequences if the sequences the step count of sequences is going down with every operation, no matter what that operation is doing to the numbers in, in the short term or even in the long term, eventually the sequence will return to one because the steps in the sequence will be exhausted. That's the only reasonable way to look at it. So what I'm gonna show here is the beginning of some sequences they're all cut off. And I'm going to demonstrate just one fundamental um, thing that it seems mathematicians have overlooked, and that is the repetition of sequences. I know that sounds pretty far-fetched, but I don't think it is. Um, so consider 59. I'm just <laughs> it's kind of feeble, but what's the second number in 59? It's 89. Okay, um, and then you can go down to 89 here, just down the number line. You don't need to go across like this at all. You just need to go down the number line, but then you'll see the same numbers repeating themselves again, obviously, 89, 67, 101, 25, because if one number is the same, the sequence from that point is the same. It's that simple. Um, again, with 101, um, we see here that there's a number preceding 101 because there's always a number preceding any number because sequences, um, as they head to one, if you want to think about it that way, are coming from infinity. Actually, I think you could equally think, you know, they're typically called convergent sequences. I think you could think of them as divergent sequences as well, but whatever the case, the number before 101 is 67, uh, but then everything else is the same, obviously. 101, 25, 19, 29, 7, 11. So how does this translate into a graph, which, you know, these graphs are what get people excited about the Kovacs conjecture? Well, depending where you are in the number line, you're going to be slicing this like so. And every time you get a little peak, that means you're going further up the number line, right? So these are the biggest numbers that the sequence is reaching in the number line, and then it collapses. So why does it collapse? It's actually, don't think about the magnitude of the numbers. Just think about the steps, whatever operation is performed on the sequence will produce fewer steps. And that's what I'm gonna uh, drive home in the rest of this presentation. 
So here is some more of those generated sequences. And I am putting them here only to demonstrate something. And that is, you can just put a rectangle around the, the consecutive integers. Actually, in my last um, presentation, uh, I had the rectangle around the first output of uh, the first output from the consecutive integers, and which you can learn a great deal from that, just about everything. And that would in itself be sufficient to study the entire Colette's conjecture. You don't need the rest of the numbers because all of them are repeated in the, uh, in, in, uh, they're all repeated in the consecutive integers, the odd numbers. But what I want to demonstrate in this video is this. All we need is, in fact, the very first column and uh, some knowledge about the function. Um, so one can definitely call this a, a Turing machine. It's just one endless tape. That's why I've got an infinity symbol behind it. This is an infinite tape. And it's a total Turing machine because I know it always halts and actually it it always well it either halts on one that's the conservative way to look at it or you could just say it halts and i'll get to that um so yeah so here's my idea uh as soon, so this is the head on the turing machine and uh suitably nerdy and so he reads a number and then he instructs the tape to go up or down to the next number because he knows what the function is. But I'm also showing here the suggestion that as soon as he touches or sees a number he's already seen, then he's done. <laughs> he doesn't need to go further than that. So this has really piqued my interest, this, this idea and um, I'm definitely going to uh, write some code for this. I have 90% of this code already because just as in the previous slide where I showed you that Excel um, um, distribution of sequences, um, I can just basically compress that into the first column. Shouldn't be too difficult. I've written a ton of VBA code on this uh, subject, and I always get new things out of it. So what I want to do is get a metric on these duns. How many duns are there? <laughs> um, I'm very intrigued about this. It might be something really obvious, but I can't imagine at the moment what it is. How many, say, I might do a million sequences and see how many times done appears. Well, we know it's going to appear on one, we know it's going to appear on five, <laughs> and so on. Uh, all right, so I'm going to come back to this concept. And it's not a concept, it's a reality that there are three series of numbers interlaced with each other. And you'll find these obviously in the complete number line of odd numbers. So one is congruence A, one is congruence B, one is congruence C. A is n plus 1 divisible by 4. B is n minus 1 divisible by 8. C is n minus 1 divisible by 4. Now, if you look at the actual numbers, it's not as crazy as that seems. So you've got 3, 7, 11, 15, that's gaps of 4. You've got 1, 9, 17, 25, gaps of 8. And you've got 5, 13, 21, 29, gaps of 8. Now they all start in a different place. So that they absolutely, if you consider these series to be sets, they are disjoint. There is no intersection between these three sets. So, that's, so you can map these down the spreadsheet before you'd find they're repeating C-A-B-A, C-A-B-A. So A appears twice, C once, B once, and so it repeats every fourth unit. Uh, 50 in it. Yeah, so that's another little bit of my animation. 
Okay. Um, so here we have the three operations, uh, and this is what the head knows about. He knows about the congruence, and he knows about the operation. So uh, the operations for the first one, for, for A, B, and C. <laughs> for A, it's M plus 1 times 1.5 minus 1. For B, it's N minus 1 times 0 0.75 plus 1. For C, it's M minus 1 times 0 0.25, that's division by 4. Um, multiplication by one and a half, um, multiplication by three quarters. Um, now, um, the thing, in, so as I said, the head has these, knows about these operations and knows about the, which numbers to apply them to based on C, A, B, A. That's all the head needs to know. So we're still talking about the Turing machine, which I think is a very, very useful abstract analogy for this. Oh, so notice that 1.5 is a increasing operation. It adds to the number. And the other two subtract from the number. So if you believe the conjecture is false, that numbers can grow infinitely, which they cannot, you, you would have to believe that um, one point that the um, a operation a would repeat itself um, vastly more than pr probability would permit it to repeat itself. Uh, if you can imagine a tetrahedron die, that's a three-sided die. Um, or is it a four-sided <laughs> Anyway, one, only one, so two faces would be A, one face would be B, one would be C. I guess it's four-sided. So how many times does it have to land on A to grow more than B and C? And remembering C quarters the size of the number. Well, um, statistically, it's impossible. And it's impossible very quickly. And one reason is you cannot have more than a few consecutive A operations because they burn out. And I showed that in the previous presentation that N plus one has factors of two always. And as you multiply by 1.5, which is a fractional number, you um, you lose those factors of two. And once it has only two factors of two left, it has to switch to one of the other operations, B or C. So there we are. This is the function um, that unlocks every door into the conjecture. I've just put together the congruences, that's the property of a number we're looking for, and the operations associated with that number. Now, oh, I think I already said this. There is no inverse operation. When I, in, uh, what I said before explains why, and I'll show you exactly why here. There is no operation that can add a step um, to a sequence. Uh, uh, I, and um, even for A, the growth operation does not add a step. And you can see here, factors of two diminishing as the sequence continues with operation A, to you on, so you only have two twos left. And you see factors of three are replacing them, exactly what you would expect with multiplication by 1.5. Um, so when you get to this point, the congruence has to switch to B or C. Now, um, why would factors of two determine steps? Because if you think about the even odd sequences, you know that there are one or two or more even steps uh, between odd numbers. So they're steps. So if you remove them, if you just, this is the, this is the same two, um, two by two is a step. Um, 
in every case. So in the even odd sequences. And it works just the same way in the odd sequences. You lose one step with each of these. I, I think I explained that better in the previous presentation, but believe me, factors of two are what determine steps. And as factors of two are um, depleted, so is the step count with every single operation. So let's look how each congruence acts on a sequence. And A is the one that increases the magnitude of numbers. So 107 becomes 161. So would that have any effect on the steps in the sequence? Actually, no, none whatsoever. So we look at the next sequence and it begins on 161. Lo and behold, we we already know that because we see 161 follows 107. So uh, so 107 has 43 odd steps and 161 has 42 odd steps, one fewer steps. What a surprise! The number got bigger, but the step steps the step count got fewer by one. Surprise! Surprise! So here's operation B, and we know that this reduces numbers. And in this case, for sequence 121, the next step is 91. And then it goes up again. That looks like obviously like an operation A. And then the next one is an operation B. So you see how it works. And we know this sequence, or I know this sequence has 41 steps. Now, I wonder how many steps 91 has. <laughs> Sequence 91. Surprise, it only has 40 steps, one fewer. One fewer steps. What a surprise, uh, indeed. Um, that, um, and to, you know, to treat these as two separate sequences is quite absurd. Um, and one cannot help thinking that maybe mathematicians are doing that. Um, because, um, well, I'm just thinking of Terence Tao's paper, which, you know, has been lauded. Uh, he wrote it a couple of years ago, and it's got the word almost twice in it. And it sounds like it, the way he's looking at the whole problem is that like every sequence has an independent life and that's what makes it such a hard problem to solve. OMG. Operation C, this is the one which really reduces the magnitude of numbers. So we look at 165, this is sequence 165. So, um, so operation C is 165 minus one, 164, divided by four, 41. Okay, um, great. So that's got 48 odd steps. There's such a big drop in the magnitude of the number. Ooh, we should lose two or three steps, right? No, no, again, we, we lose just one, one fewer steps. And surprise, surprise, um, there's a sequence that begins with 165, and there's a sequence that begins with 41, and there's a sequence that begins with 31, and so on. They're the same sequence. They're absolutely the same sequence. And of course, there's a number before 165. I can't tell you what it is. So all operations lose one step. I wonder what that means. Well, <laughs> this is the last slide. Each operation if each operation removes one step from every sequence, um, whatever the initial number is, what is the conclusion? A is one fewer steps, B is one fewer steps, C is one fewer steps. Therefore, all sequences must end. Thank you for listening. See you next time.